pleasure, it's an honor, a privilege to be here with you today. Thank you on behalf of the Association of Foreign Press Correspondents for being with us, for accepting our honorary award, the Foreign Press Honorary Award this year. And my first question to, for all those watching us is, the award is a recognition. Most people, do you agree that they don't understand what has been behind to reach the point of getting an award. There is a lot of hard work, probably a lot of years of disappointments, failures, successes. I would like to hear from you a little bit of the story, the background story of how a person can reach out this level, the point that you are today. I have to tell you, this is the second award I've ever received in my life, and the first one was like two weeks ago. So, um, and the first one was an Italian award um, for satire, and uh, it w the guy I talked to the, uh, from the organization told me, this is a Lifetime Achievement Award. I said, what? He said, yes. I said, um, I said well, here's what you have to understand. Usually when you get a Lifetime Achievement Award, it's preceded by many other awards. This is the first award I ever got, all right? It was this Lifetime Achievement Award. So maybe my life's gonna go backwards, and in 25 years, I'll go out of here from high school. So this is the second award. So the, to me, what this, shows really is what I've been saying to my friends for a few years. This is the era of the old lady. You know, that's what it has to be. You know, that everyone decided finally, you know who we like? Old ladies. I mean, of course the world prefers dead women, but you know, <laughs> next to dead, old is better. So I really believe that, you know, when I was young, you know, my first book came out when I was 27, there was an award I should have gotten then in my opinion, I didn't get anything. So, you know, I mean, of course the world has changed immensely in that amount of time. Um, but it's changed in that direction. I now, now know that young women also get things. But, you know, it's too late for me to get something young, so I'm happy to get it old. So you think that if you were in this era today and you were younger in your 20s, you, do you think that you could have more possibilities, more opportunities to be recognized earlier, like at that level? Because oh, no question. I mean, you know, my first book was a big hit, you know, great like reviews and stuff like that, but I didn't get any awards, you know. Uh, Do you the, think that there was a little bit of discrimination? No, a lot. A lot. Not a little bit, okay? A lot. I mean, one of the things that, I mean, a lot of things have deteriorated in my lifetime, but one of the things that has improved immensely is the position of women. I mean, it's not good, but it is so much better. Uh, you know, I mean, it's better in some places than others. This was always the case. Uh, but no, uh, yes, of course, it's much better. You know. So you would like to be in your 20s today, and what would you do differently if you were in your 20s? I'd buy an apartment. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's the main thing. Um, it's not the question whether I would like to be in my 20s now. You know, I mean, lots of people, of course, people who are younger than me, which is pretty much everyone now, um, ask me all the time. You know, kids come up to me in the street for the past 10 years at least. And when I say kids, I mean people in their 20s, asking, you know, saying to me, Oh, I wish I lived in New York in the 70s. It looks so much fun, you know. And this, in a certain way, is quite disturbing because I believe that nostalgia is an incredibly poisonous, uh, you know, emotion or, you know, uh, sensibility. Uh, nostalgia for something you never lived through is kind of crazy. But I also know that when I was in my 20s, I didn't go up to people in the street saying, I wish I lived in New York in my 30s, you know. But the reason for that, I don't think has anything to do with me. I think it has to do with the fact that the 70s in New York has now achieved this kind of worldwide, you know, position the way like Paris in the 20s. You know, there's some eras that are just seem very glamorous to people. Um, so I have spent a lot of time in the last several years trying to determine whether I think something was better because it was actually better or because it's just simply better to be in your 20s than in your 60s or 70s. It's more fun, by which I mean. No, it's just better. So, you know, I would say that um, of course, any p person would rather be in their 20s than 70. Um, but since every person can only be in their 20s once, truthfully, I'm glad I was in my 20s then. Because, you know, the, the worse the world looks to me, the more you think, well, whenever these cataclysmic things are supposed to happen, you know, in 30 years there'll be no water. But at first when I hear this, I always think, oh my God, then I realize he'll be dead. You know, don't worry about there's no water, but they should worry about it, you know. So I think it's a very... I don't, I mean, it did seem, you know, when I was young, that it didn't seem so dire, the future, as it seems now. You know, I hope that these predictions are wrong, you know, uh, but even if I'm not here, but, uh, I mean, things are pretty bad worldwide. 
It's not like there's one country where you think, why don't we have that president? There's no place in the world where I think they have a fantastic government. You know, the, uh, democracies across the world are in a lot of trouble. Do you think that the um, younger generation of people, of young professionals who are now in their 20s, 30s, they are trying to set up their lives, do you think that they have the same prospect of hope that you had at that age? No, I don't. Because, I mean, I mean, I don't know how they feel. You know, how other people feel, I only know what they tell me. You know, so, I mean, half the time, I don't know how but I you feel. you speak with a lot of people, younger. Yes, I mean, the, the, one of the big differences is, and may, this may be just true of me as opposed to everyone my age. I never thought about the future in that way when I was young. I mean, first of all, I was not, they're very much more organized than I was. And in fact, that most people my age were. You know, they're really organized. At a very young age, they said, I want to go to this school. I want to get this job. I want to live in this place. I want to make this much money. I want to marry this person. They like, they're used to ordering things in a very specific way. This was not true of me. I mean, at all. So I, you know, I never really thought about it. I, I, it just never occurred to me. Uh, I, you know, uh, I, I think that because when you do that, which everyone does now, um, then you can very easily fail. In other words, if you, and because oh, this stuff is made up, the future is a fantasy for everybody. I don't care how you prepare. You know, no one knows the future. So when people ask me all the time, we, we also now have, at least in this country, you know, hundreds, thousands of people whose profession is predicting the future. You know, they're almost all wrong all the time. If you, and I always say when people tell me something like that, if you really know the future, buy a lottery ticket. You know, and then you have to worry about this stuff. So I don't know what's going to happen. It doesn't look swell to me. Um, but if I was, it's also the question, if you were young now, is an impossible one to answer. Because, <coughs> I'm sorry, uh, there's no context for me being young now. If I was young now, I would be a completely different person. In what way? In every possible way. You well, know, I, I would, now what you just said you brings me to my next question on what would you have done differently? Like three major things that you had you would have done different, except for the apartment that you had <laughs> bought an apartment. Other three major things that you could you would change. I think I would would have um, I would have, would have been better off noticing so that some of the things that happened to me or some of the obstacles I encountered were not about me. They were about, for instance, being a woman, which I never thought about. You know, uh, uh, they were about being gay, you know, which I did know about, you know. So <clears throat> there were, uh, I took, when I say I took everything personally, I don't mean in a tragic way, but I thought, you have to do this. This isn't working, you have to do that. Um, and I just thought of like, you know, that this was me, not this was the forces of the society against me. Um, <clears throat> in a way, I think that's good. And there were certain things I just skipped, okay? For instance, you know, feminism as a, as a, uh, a form of activism, you know, was uh, starting in the 70s, and I never was involved with it. And it wasn't that I thought they were wrong, it's that I thought this is never gonna work. And it really hasn't worked very well, by the way. It worked better than I thought it would, but it didn't really work. The same thing with gay rights. They were starting this stuff, and I thought, are you crazy? This is never gonna work. The extent to which that worked, you know, is unimaginable, really unimaginable. You know, the one thing that I d was involved with was, you know, the uh, uh, you know protests against the Vietnam War. That did seem to work, you know. But of course, in retrospect, I see why it did not. It had something to do with the fact they were marching and stuff like that. But that is an incident as opposed to something, you know, that is in the fabric of the culture. Mm -hmm. you, you know. Let's talk a little bit about journalism, disinformation. Do you think that it is a real threat in our society, the disinformation aspect of how the new technology and online um, digital information tools have been spread spreading this misinformation? And do you think that journalism can save a little bit of the historical truth of what is happening around us for the future generations? It's the most dangerous thing in the culture before the internet, from a point of view of journalism, when journalism was newspapers, um, radio, television, um, there, especially here, you know, there was no argument 
that was not settled by the person saying, if you said, where did you, why do you think that? And they say it was in the New York Times. That was the end of any argument. That, I mean, the New York Times was like the authority of the entire country. So, and of course they had mistakes, you know, but uh, not the kind of mistakes you see now. So I think that is that it's a better thing that there are, uh, I don't know, venues, you know, or publications or something that everyone agrees. No one argued, no one said, you know, the New York Times is wrong. There's not really a war in Vietnam. I mean, there was nothing like I mean, I mean, I suppose there were still some lunatics, you know, with conspiracy theory. There were people who didn't think that the United States, you know, sent a man to the moon, you know, but it was like two people, you know, not half the country. So <clears throat> it's very dangerous, this stuff now. It's extremely dangerous. It's the most dangerous thing there is. What do you think that make up success for a person, for a professional, for a journalist, based on all of your wisdom that you have <laughs> accumulated over the years. It, it is, you, you carry wisdom, and that's why people like to hear you. It's not because you are only provocative and you have views that are opposed to the common sense sometimes, or the basic common logic. It's because you carry wisdom, and I think that in our age, in our era, it is important to have people who bring wisdom in this landscape of disinformation and, you know, easily consuming stuff. It's only because when you're old you remember things. That's, I mean, I at least, some old people don't. Some, there are people even older than me. Uh, um, not in the room, of course. But, uh, you know, it, until COVID, every single, th after a certain age, I don't know what age that would be, but like say your 40s or something like that, and no matter what happened, it would remind you of something else. That's what looks like wisdom to people. Like, you know, this is, you, you may not even say, this is kind of like that, so this would happen. COVID was not like anything that ever happened in my lifetime. There was no analogy to it. It did not remind me of anything. And hence, I did not know how to think about it. I mean, when it first happened, you know, when I first kind of realized it was, you know, what was happening, um, I, the, fir the first thing I realized after that was, I don't know how to think about this. Not that I don't know how to feel about it. You know, also, most people, at least in this country, you know, say think when they mean feel. So I know the difference between feel and think. That's a very important distinction, I think. So Toni Morrison, you know, uh, who was a very close friend of mine, as soon as this happened, I said to uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the guy who was my editor and her editor and a close friend of both of us, I said, no, I miss Tony every day, but don't you miss her right now the most? He said, yes. I said, because we don't know how to think about this. And even though Tony, who was quite a bit older than me, wasn't so old that she remembered the, uh, 20, uh, uh, the 1918 flu epidemic, um, she still would have, th I could have said, Tony, how do you think about this? Not what do you think about this? What's the best way to think about this? And if anyone would have known, she would have known. So by the time I, uh, I figured out how to think about this, you know, it was months into it, you know. So now, should this happen again, I know how to think about it, you know. But I mean, <clears throat> I, 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 and that was hampered everybody, even people in charge of things, which I've never been in charge of anything, but um, the fact that people respond so emotionally to everything, you know, is really to the detriment of society. My last question, because I would love to have a conversation, endless conversation with you, but my last question is, what is the message you would like to send out to the young journalists who start their career right now with a lot of dreams, a lot of hopes, sometimes a lot of planning of what they're going to do in their future? Um, what is your advice from your wisdom perspective? I mean, I, there are certain jobs in journalism, I don't know how to get people to do them. The people that I see, you know, or read about, who are in places where there's wars, where there's earthquakes, and, and my whole life I've thought this, you know, uh, I've thought like, how do they get people to do this? You know, I am way too cowardly to ever have been involved in anything like that. You know, I have a tremendous amount of physical cowardice, more than the average person. Um, there seem to be a lot of people 
willing to do this. You know, um, there seem to be, you know, there's two ways, there's more than two, but, you know, among the ways that people can respond to danger like that um, is either to be terrified and say, no, you go, um, or to, to think this is an important thing. I, you know, I want to report on this. It's incredibly important. You know, uh, it's incredibly important that among the real job of journalists, which is to tell the truth, I'm afraid that younger people have to convince a lot of people this is the truth. Here I am, I'm standing here, here is this war going on, and half the country here says it's a fake picture. You know, I mean, that is now a new job of journalism, is to convince people this is reality. You know, to have to convince people that this is reality is a pretty daunting task, and I would say to these people, good luck.